if you've got your copy of God's Word, let's go to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4 tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 4 is we're going to start off, and uh, we're going to start off um, having some lectures. So my, my goal is to alternate weeks. One week we'll do a Old Testament study, uh, New Testament study, and then one on uh, theology. And a lot of people get scared off by this or turned off by this, but I, I'm going to do my best to, first of all, make it exciting for you. And, and to make it applicable, because uh, a lot of times uh, I've, I've heard this, well, I'm not a theologian. Well, we're all theologians, and uh, I'll never forget what uh, Ed Walls used to say. He was my uh, professor uh, in most of my theology classes at Baptist Bible College. He, he would say, your theology is going to determine who you are. So what we, what we believe, it's going to determine what we are, or who we are going to be. So 1 Timothy chapter 4. And Paul is writing here to Timothy, and he's telling him how to lead. He's telling him Timothy's a young pastor, and, and Timothy needed encouragement. Timothy needed some training, and Paul gave him that. And I want you to see verses 13 through 16, and then I'm going to pray. He says, Till I come, give attendance to reading. So he's, he's, when he says reading, he's not just talking about books, he's telling him literally. Give attention to the Word of God. So give attention to reading, to exhortation. That's teaching in a way to encourage action, to doctrine. So we we see a command here for Timothy, but it's also a command for us that we need to give attention to doctrine. And I'm going to talk more about that here in a minute. But neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now boy, that, that, that statement right there could preach. All of us in this room need a reminder tonight. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Neglect not the gift that is in you as a person. Every single one of you have a gift. You may say, well, I can't do what I did even a year ago. You still have gifts. You can still pray. You can still talk to folks. Maybe it's over the phone. Maybe it's over text message. Um, I, I've, I've seen several. I remember I was at a at a church, little church in, in West Springfield, and there'd be older folks at VBS. Kids might have been sitting on the floor. That person wasn't on the floor, but they were in a chair and they had their Bible open, giving the gospel to some kid. By the way, just because you might think you're at a certain stage in life, don't think kids won't listen to you. Uh, kids listen to Linda. She'll she'll tell you. You just. You just, you just got to look them square in the eye. They'll listen to you. We got to read on though. I just really got a hold of me reading that. Which was given thee by, the, by pro, uh, um, prophecy with the laying on of, uh, of hand, the hands by the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. There's that word doctrine again. And doctrine is teaching. Doctrine, is it going to divide? Yeah, it's going to divide, but sometimes that has to happen. But it's teaching. Give heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine or the teaching continuing in them. And here's, here's why doctrine is important. For in doing this, then, for in doing, them, so, for in doing this, excuse me, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, I, I'm going to say this and I'm going to pray. There's people that have, that have not even come in this church yet, but the doctrine we hold to, it's going to make a difference in their life. Because the, the world, and I, not even the world, the church growth books would tell us to grow to change our doctrine. That's what they will tell us. There, there are books saying, if you change your doctrine, in fact, there was a movement in the 50s, Harold Ockengay was, was part of this, and they said, change the doctrine and people will show up. Well, in that instance, people didn't. And... Let's say we did change our doctrine. Let's say we got a... I know there's one event we could schedule and it'd get a lot of people in the room. But is it going to change their lives? I'm telling you, friends, doctrine changes people's lives. Derek has a doctrine of salvation that he gave this morning of what Jesus did for him. That was doctrine. He talked about what Jesus Christ did for him. That is a doctrinal issue because the liberal says everybody's saved. The... Bible believer says everybody's a sinner and needs to be saved. And that's a doctrine. That, that divides. That's important. I've, 
I've got to pray and then I've got to get my water and we've got to get on. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day, Lord. I thank You for uh, this evening. I thank You for these dear people that are here. I pray as we dive into Your Word and dive into this material that we have a better understanding and even an excitement in a way for doctrine. Not to just be so we can prove that we're right, but so we can live in a way that impacts every area of our life so that we can go out there living in a way that impacts other people. May what we learn here tonight inspire us to do something big for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What do I talk about? Systematic theology, intro to Bible doctrines. and Systematic theology is a big word, but all that means is systematically studying certain areas of the Bible. And what we think about these areas of the Bible, it's going to determine how we interpret Scripture. For example, there's there's a doctrine of the Bible called bibliology. Big word, but how we approach that is going to determine what we do with it. The liberal, once again, will say that the Bible is not the Word of God or that it just contains the Word of God. The Bible believer will say the Bible is God's authoritative, inerrant, Word of God. That's going to change the direction. You can take the direction of the liberal that that denies that it's truth. You can take the direction of the Bible believer that says this is the authoritative, inspired, inerrant Word of God. And as just like I got from the other stuff, this isn't something I got thought up on my own. I've, I've pulled together material from men that are much smarter than me. Men that have taught on this issue much better than me. And I always want to acknowledge that Max Anders, he's written a book called uh, 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. Uh, really, really good author and a really good way of distilling things down. Harold Wilmington, he developed what's called the Liberty Home Bible Institute back in the mid-70s. It was on cassette tapes. Anybody remember cassette tapes? They had ribbon inside of them. Uh, maybe some of you might have sang the soundtracks of those and you had to rewind them. You know, you know, now we just hit a file back there on the computer and there's no rewinding. You just click off the file when you're done with it. And then Dr. Ed, Ed Heinsohn, and I know for a fact two of these men are in heaven, so um, they, they lived a long life teaching Jesus, teaching doctrinal stuff for a long time. So uh, this is a, an introduction to the Bible doctrines, what we're looking at. So a couple of verses I want to read to you is Acts 2, um, 42, and it says... And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. So this is what the early church did. They focused on doctrine. They focused on fellowship. The uh, breaking of bread. Most people would would believe and teach that that's the observance of the Lord's Supper. Perhaps it was just them sharing meals together. And they came together and prayed, which is why we have a ladies' prayer time. You know, that's part of why we still have Sunday nights is partially for that ladies' prayer time. Uh, and, and then in prayers, which is why our, our Wednesday night service is so important. And then 1 Timothy 4, 6, I read uh, the latter part, but the early part of that chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6 says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, what things is he talking about? Well, he's talking about doctrine. If, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, then thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. A good minister of Jesus Christ reminds us of doctrine. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he's saying that the doctrine nourishes you. It it gives you security. It gives you freedom. So what is doctrine? Doctrine means teaching that is to be followed. The apostles' doctrine that it talks about in Acts 2.42, that was a teaching that they taught other people so that they might follow Jesus better. The doctrines of the Bible are teachings found in God's Word that reveal God, the Creator of all things, and His relationship to His creation. You know, God has a a relationship with creation. There is a a teaching, which once again is a doctrine, called deism. Anybody ever heard of deism? Which One of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, was actually a very devout deist. Which A deist believes that God created everything, and then just stepped back and has no interaction with, no relationship with that creation. But even though he believed that, he called on everyone to pray. 
The study of Bible doctrines is the attempt to organize different aspects of God's revelation into component parts. In other words, we're seeing how things come together to help you understand who God is, to help you understand His plan for the world. It's, it's not about being right. I, I used to think for years, well, we've got to be right, we've got to be right. It, it's much bigger than that. It, 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 even if we're right, it, 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 it's, it doesn't matter if it doesn't change us. The word doctrine, as found in the Bible, refers to the systematic, often simple, gathering and presentations concerning any great truth. So what is theology? Theology is the study or science of God. Miller Derrickson. Augustus Strong has another one. The science of God and the relations between God and the universe. And then Charles Ryrie, he's, he, he, Charles Ryrie knows how to really word things really well. He's got a book called um, Basic Theology. And he, he words things in a very simple way, in a way you can understand it. Um, so he says theology is thinking about God and expressing those thoughts in some way. And Webster's Dictionary gives us a definition of theology, rather lengthy, but I'll read it. It says, the science of God or religion, the science which uh, treats the existence, character, attributes of God, His laws, His government, the doctrines uh, we are to believe, and the duties we are to practice. Divinity, as more commonly understood, the knowledge derivable from the Scriptures. Theology must come from Scripture. The systematic exhibition of revealed truth, the science of the Christian faith and life. Why is this important? Because it's, 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 it's reasonable to ask, why is this important? Well, 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines and of devils. Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's, this is why doctrine is important right here, this verse I just read. There are people, once again, that will say, get rid of your doctrine, you'll fill up your church. Get rid of what you believe. Don't, if you, you're being so narrow saying that God's Word's infallible. You're so narrow saying that people are sinners that need to be saved from a flaming eternal hell. That's narrow-minded. But Paul says, there's going to be coming a time where they will give heed, they'll depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies. And here's the, sad, here's the saddest part of that passage. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You ever had a wound cauterized before? I've never had a wound cauterized with heat, but I had a mole taken off one time, and they used, so they don't have to, you know, use a hot poker or anything like that. They have some, some chemical now they can put on you that it feels like it's a little bit of a burn, and you, you feel just a little, a little tingly. There's no feeling there. So when, when these people got away from doctrine, and their conscience was seared with, with a hot iron, and, and Paul said this was going to happen, it has happened, when they get soft on these things... Word of God has no effect anymore. Just like when I had that part of my skin cauterized with that liquid, the same thing can happen to our spirit if we get away from doctrine. Things don't hit us anymore. Somebody gets up and preaches real hard, we either get offended or we're, or we're just... goes right by us because it doesn't have any effect on us. And I read 13 through 16 to open things up, but 2 Timothy, which is just a few pages over, 2 Timothy chapter, uh, was it 4? Yeah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul says there, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and, appear, the quick and the dead. So those that are alive, those are, that, are, that have already went on, at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word, be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all suffering 
and doctrine. Once again, for time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're there, brothers and sisters. We're there where people don't endure sound doctrine. We've had somebody since I've been here visit here, and this person called me, and and they were saying some some things that, that, that were just way out there. Way out there. Haven't been back since. But after their own lusts, shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. A lot of people go to churches today wanting to hear just a feel-good story. So doctrine will save us from theological food poisoning. Doctrine will settle us. Ephesians 4, uh, 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 14. I think I could quote it, but I want to read it to make sure. So here's what he says about doctrine, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. When we're not settled, that's what happens to us. When somebody comes by, they hear something, and they're taken away. By the slight of men, in cunning craftiness, thereby they lay wait to deceive. So what he's telling the church at Ephesus there is that doctrine helps keep you settled on an issue. When somebody says something or tries to get you to waver, that you stand firm. That you're, that you're rock solid in where you're at. Doctrine will acquaint us with the details of God's eternal plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. In verse 2, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, and did eat the same spiritual meat. He's telling them there about God's plan and how God works. Romans chapter number 11 and verse 25 tells us, For I would not, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Paul wanted people to have some understanding. So we've seen twice now tonight where he has said, I do not want you to be ignorant. I want you to have some understanding of what God's doing and what God wants to do. And listen to what he says here. You should, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, which a mystery is something that was hidden. But now it's revealed. It's not like Indiana Jones and the Lost Last Crusade or Lost Crusade or whatever where you have to go and unearth something. He's saying that through Christ, this is now available. It was, it was a little bit hidden, but now it's available. And he says, Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. He's trying to give them details of God's plan. And there's some additional verses there. We don't. We just simply don't have time to to look at tonight. But you've got you get the picture here that God has a plan, and he and he wants you to understand details about. It. We aren't going to understand all of it, but he does want you to understand enough of it to know what he wants you to do. I don't know why that's. I think it's because I went backwards. Okay, doctrine helps us to edify. Helps us to build up. Second Timothy two fifteen. We we've read that several times. Uh, if doctrine helps equip, help us to equip ourselves. So for us to do ministry, for us to be able to know to help people, sometimes to know what people need to hear at certain times, it takes doctrine to know that. It takes doctrine to know uh, what's sometimes what's going on. Knowing the attributes of God. How can we say, well, God loves everybody? Well, that's a good statement by itself. It is a good statement, but when we understand God's truth, how does God love everybody? Well, we, we've got to have some doctrine to know how God loves everybody. To say, well, God loves everybody, right? that sounds good. 
That sounds good. If, if, if my kids said God loves everybody, man, I'd, I'd be praising them. But there does come a point where we need to have more understanding than just, well, God loves everybody. How does He love everybody? He provided you a Savior. He has sustained you. He's done this in your life. He's done that in your life. We've got some people here tonight uh, God's provided jobs for. But if we don't understand how God loves, we don't see that God provided those jobs. We don't see how God's made provision in our lives. The doctrine of man is important. And if we look at the doctrine of man, that's going to be way down the line. But when you look at the doctrine of man, that ought to make us weep over lost souls. When you look at the doctrine of man, you know, I, I can still remember, the, it's called an, doctrine of anthropo anthropology. That's a big theological word or big word. They even have it in secular schools. They, uh, 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 anthropologists just study a man is all that that means. I can remember, I've had that class a couple of times at, 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 at master's levels and, and at undergrad levels. And every time, I just feel dirty every time I've studied doctrine of man. You know, to give us a, 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 a thirst to see people come to God when we study the doctrine of man. That's why this is important, the problem. Churches today can become cold and indifferent to the cause of Jesus Christ. Why? Because of a lack of knowledge of the Scriptures, of the Word of God. This was foretold in Scriptures. We, we read 1 Timothy 4.1, I believe, earlier. If you think, look back into Hosea's days in the Old Testament... People were destroyed then because of a lack of knowledge. And you want to talk about love. People want to say, oh, God's so judgmental and harsh in the Old Testament. Go read Hosea. That's all about love. That's all about long-suffering. God even tells those people, look, you're being destroyed because you have a lack of knowledge for me. Yes, you kept some traditions intact. Yes, you kept some things there in Hosea's day. But he uses one illustration of, of them being a pancake cooked on one side. We've got some ladies in here that are really good cooks. But would you cook a pancake on one side and then serve it to people? That would be one of the most disgusting breakfasts you could think of. Would Terry eat a pancake cooked on one side? No, he'd send it back. I would too. But God's trying to say, here's how silly it is. You kept these feasts. Study Hosea. Go do a read on Hosea sometime. They kept a lot of these feasts because, hey, we like to eat. We're good Baptists here. We like to eat. We've got ladies that can cook. And we've got men that like to eat. Praise God. Well, in Hosea's day, they just kept the feasts. They didn't have any theology. They had activity, but they didn't have theology to, to go with the activity. These doctrines must become part of your life, not just head knowledge. It must be in your heart, not just in your mind. How many times do we tell people when they want to accept Christ and they want to pray, it's not just the words. It's got to be in your heart. You've got to mean it with your heart. Yes, Romans 10 tells us with confession comes that salvation, but it also says it's with the heart. That's where it starts. I'm sure there's people that have repeated a prayer and didn't, didn't, lead, didn't walk away anymore saved than they were when they went in. But I also know there's people that have prayed a prayer, but because in their heart they meant it, because in their heart they knew they were lost, because they understood some theology, to be honest, was that they were deprived and they knew they needed a Savior and they wanted Jesus to save them, that they were saved. But it wasn't because of the words, it was because their heart, they knew they needed to express that faith in Christ for salvation. Paul Chapel once said, True doctrine is essential to the faith. It is the glue that binds the church together. We've got to have some unity. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have unity on everything, but my goodness, you go out here, every kind of car made known to man is out here. We're not unified on our cars. We're not unified on our sports teams. Some might root for this team. Some might root for another team. That isn't what unifies us. You know, look, I, I grew up a Kansas City Chiefs fan. I, I've, I've been brainwashed for the last 30 years to not like the Oakland Raiders, and I still call them the Oakland Raiders even though they're in Las Vegas. But that doesn't determine my fellowship with somebody. 
Vance Havner says it this way, the early Christians condemned false doctrine in a way that sounds almost unchristian today. And we think about that statement. A lot of things come to mind. John Stott said this way, good conduct arises out of good doctrine. Good conduct arises out of good doctrine. So where are we going to go in our journey here? So there's ten major doctrines that are usually put out there. So we're going to look at the Bible. It's going to be our jumping off point. Some people start at God. Some people start at the Bible. But we're going to start at the Bible. We're going to go to God. They look at the three, the Trinity there. God the Son. God the Father. God the Holy Spirit. See how they work. How they work together. We'll look at Christ. Study of Jesus. Not, not His um, events. That's what we're going to see in our New Testament study. But we're going to Look at a study of His person. How He operates. His attributes. Because listen, you've got to have a knowledge of Jesus' attributes so you can see Him as you're reading in the Old Testament. As you, as you understand Jesus' attributes, you can see Him when you look at the life of Joseph. You can see Him when you look at the life of Moses. You can see Him when you look at other people that are being used. Anytime you see terms like deliverer, it's an illustration of Jesus because Jesus is our deliverer. We'll see the Holy Spirit and how He works, which is probably, in some ways, the best kept secret of most Baptist churches. If I talk about Him too much, boys, Brother Josh, you're getting Pentecostal. I'm not afraid of what the Pentecostals say. I'm not. Don't agree with everything, but I'm not, I'm not afraid to, to say you need to talk to the Holy Spirit because we end our prayers in Christ's name, Amen. We pray to the Father, but we leave out the Holy Spirit, which is why we need to study Him. They'll look at doctrine of angels, and some people do a study of Satan separate, but we'll look at Satan in that way. Why study Satan? It's not because it's not for him to get any glory, I'll tell you that. But you need to know your enemy. What do people do in warfare? They study their enemy. You look at a sports team, even, even down to, into high school football, they look at film of other teams. They study their enemy. Look at the doctrine of man. I talked about that earlier. The doctrine of sin. The fancy word for that is harmardiology. We're going to look at that. Doctrine of salvation. Doctrine of the church. Doctrine of future or last things. And then we'll look at a study of dispensation versus covenant theology. And we're going to end there tonight. But I hope your heart's stirred just a little bit by what we talked about. That theology is important. Theology is not just for a gray-haired old man at a seminary somewhere teaching. Theology is for the person sacking groceries at the grocery store. Theology is for the one that drives a school bus. Theology is for the farmer on the tractor plowing his field. Theology is for the school teacher. Theology is for the retiree trying to love on their family. Theology is for the cattle farmer. Theology is for the factory worker. Without theology, where would we be tonight? Without theology, we wouldn't see an importance in church. And I know that because you're here tonight, you have some theology or you wouldn't be here. But my goal is to do what Delilah said a few weeks ago. I know you know, probably know the Lord here tonight on a Sunday night. I want you to know Him better. I want you to know Him deeper. I want this study in theology, our study in New Testament survey, our study in Old Testament survey, to have a hunger to serve and have a hunger to go after lost souls. Because there's a whole field out here of people that nobody's going after, to be quite honest with you. And if we ever decided to just call it quits, I don't think we're even close to that, but I'm just trying to let you know that if we were to call it quits, somebody would see this property and say, hey, there's, there's a place worth having a church at. And I don't know what kind of doctrine they teach in here. I doubt it would be anything close to what we're teaching now. Because every church I've known that's called it quits, somebody else has come in and, and it's usually 
I mean, not every case, but in most cases, it's usually some weird stuff that gets taught. Hijacking the Holy Spirit to be somebody he's not. Saying, oh, it, it doesn't matter, everybody's saved, it's alright. No. We're here tonight because some men and women labored and held true to some doctrine. There's been men and women at Mount Zion Baptist Church in the last 140 years that held to some doctrine when it wasn't probably the most popular thing to hold to. When it would have been easy for them to waver on something and just, eh, it's alright, it's not a big deal. You know, this church has seen two world wars, a depression, numerous chaos in, in America through different conflicts, and we're still here. And we're still here not because there's been super duper preachers, but because you in the pew, some of you that have been here over the years, and those that have blazed the trail before us, knew doctrine was important. They knew theology was important. They may not have said the word theology, but they lived it. They lived it out with how they ministered. They lived it out with how they gave. They lived it out in their life and in their decisions. I could tell you stories I've heard in the last two years of being here that paint that picture of standing firm on theology. Won't you stand firm on theology tonight? Won't you lock arms with us and stand firm on theology and, and take this ride and just know Jesus just a little bit deeper than you knew Him yesterday. Just a little bit deeper than you knew Him a year ago. Just a little bit deeper than you knew Him before. Because I promise you, if you would just open yourself up to this, we've got a lot of stuff we're going through and there's no way anyone will retain all of it. But if you just take a piece here and a piece there of what we're talking about, I think it can change you. I think it can get you on fire and get you excited for God. Let's pray. For more information, visit our website at mountzionozark.weebly.com. And thank you for watching. We would love the opportunity to meet you and get to know you better. Feel free to come visit during one of our services. Have a blessed day.